Hi, everyone. I'm going to speak for just a few minutes about how it is that you go about measuring the social impact of media. In the late 1990s, the Centers for Disease Control discovered that half of Americans believed that all the health information that they saw in fictional TV shows was accurate. And about a quarter of Americans said that this was one of their primary sources of health information. So the CDC decided that they needed a partner on the ground in Hollywood to try to increase the accuracy of health depictions in these TV shows. And now for 15 years, we've been in a cooperative agreement with the CDC to try to make sure that we do that, to, to make health stories more accurate in fictional TV. Now, one reason that CDC decided to do this was because there were decades of research demonstrating that if you embedded educational information into compelling entertainment content, it could lead to gains in knowledge, uh, uh, higher levels of awareness of issues, and sometimes behavior change. And a lot of that research had actually come out of USC Annenberg and its alumni. So this is how the Hollywood Health and Society Program at the Lear Center was born. And what we primarily do is provide accurate and timely health information to uh, storytellers in television who are looking for interesting and compelling and realistic stories. And we take as many uh, uh, opportunities to measure the social impact of those storylines as we possibly can. Now, the power of this model is that by piggybacking on Hollywood, we're reaching a huge global audience, right, with health information. But also, what's really important about that audience is that when they're hearing these messages, quite often they're very deeply engaged, emotionally engaged with that storytelling. Now, it may sound strange, but you can actually quantify the level of somebody's emotional engagement. There are social science methods for this. We use a scale that's called the transportation scale. So we can actually quantify engagement in this way. And in many of our impact studies, we've discovered a strong correlation between being transported by the story, being totally absorbed, and actually taking some sort of action afterwards. So I'll just mention a few of these studies. One was on Law and Order, one of Wesley's not favorite shows, but he loves it. <laughs> Uh, SVU, and this episode was focused on a character called Nardali, who had escaped from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, she'd been raped repeatedly by militias there. And it turned out that viewers, both male and female, who were highly transported by this storyline, were more likely to be supportive of foreign aid after they watched this episode. They were more likely to be interested in talking to other people about global health topics, not something that Americans typically talk about. And they knew a lot more about the asylum-seeking process and what it meant to be an immigrant in the United States. With this storyline, it turned out that females in particular, who scored very high on this transportation scale, were inclined to have conversations about cancer and to seek more information after they saw the episode. And they were having conversations specifically about Hodgkin's lymphoma. We also work with telenovelas, and we work with El Clon on Telemundo. And here again, we found that the best predictor that somebody would make some sort of health change in their life, including going and making an appointment for a pap smear, which nobody wants to do, had to do with their level of transportation, uh, how absorbed they were by the story. Now, those are three storylines, right? Well, just in six years, we actually consulted on 855 storylines that ended up airing. So you can imagine the kind of cumulative impact of this kind of program. So building on all of this research and experience in the Hollywood Health and Society program, we developed and launched the Media Impact Project in 2013. And it was really an effort to sort of stretch out a bit, move further beyond television, fictional television, to news, to film, documentary, and to try to gather as many of the best practices in media impact measurement as we could find. It gave us the opportunity to work with truly world-class media organizations to sort of further the academic field, make sure we're doing this better and better, 
uh, to apply it and to also deliver all kinds of uh, incredible insights to these companies about the ways in which their content is actually affecting people's lives. Now, we usually use mixed methods research. Uh, we're trying to sort of connect the dots between exposure to a particular piece of media and then some sort of outcome that we're looking for, whether it's a change in knowledge, attitudes, behavior. So typically, we'll do something like a content analysis. What exactly was in the piece of media we're studying? How did people interact with it? And finally, what happened offline? You, you need a survey instrument in order to find out whether people learned something, they changed their minds about something, and maybe they took action. One key component of our research is that we're always trying to construct a control group, a matched comparison group that we can compare the viewers to. So we don't want to compare apples and oranges, uh, people who would view a certain piece of media and a bunch of people who just hate that kind of media. So we try to make these matched control groups by using all of these data sets that I just mentioned. So we've done this with a news organization, with documentary film, and also with fictional film. And so I thought I'd give you just a few top line uh, findings from three of these studies. The first I'll mention is the documentary by Davis Guggenheim, Waiting for Superman, about education reform. So here's a reminder what that was about. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. How come? Because I would like to help somebody in need. You wake up every morning and you know that kids are getting a really crappy education right now. So you think that most of the kids here are getting a crappy education right now? Oh, I don't think they are. I know they are. Either the kids are getting stupider every year or something is wrong in the education system. I just have to do my best in school and make my grandmother that proud. Among 30 developed countries, we rank 25th in math and 21st in science. In almost every category, we've fallen behind, except one. Kids from the USA rank number one in confidence. I think about 60,000 people have gone to this school in 40 years. 40,000 didn't graduate. This is the damage that this school has done to this neighborhood. A child that doesn't finish high school will earn less and be eight times more likely to go to prison. I want to go to school. For these kids, their only chance at getting into a great school depends on whether their number is picked in the lottery. So if Francisca doesn't get in, is there another chance? No. Your children and future generations are on the bridge of the Titanic and everybody's going to drown. Someone has taken an interest in you, someone loves you, and they recognize the importance of education. And the first student selected, 20. Nine. It takes a lot of outrage and a lot of good examples to say, yes, we can do this. When you see a great teacher, you are seeing a work of art. I want my kids to have better than what I had. 18. 10. 12. Two. And the last number. So what we wanted to do was to find out whether viewers, compared to very similar people who had just not seen this film yet, had different kinds of outcomes in terms of knowledge and attitudes and behavior. And what we discovered is, yes, there were statistically significant differences. It turned out that people who had watched the film were more knowledgeable about education in the United States. It was more likely that they had donated books or classroom materials to schools. And it was more likely that they had volunteered or mentored a student. We also were really curious about the choir. You know how documentary filmmakers are often accused of just preaching to the choir? Well, we wondered, maybe that's an important thing, and does it work? So what we did is we isolated a, a subgroup of our viewers and non-viewers who had been really active in education reform five to 10 years before the film came out. We wanted to see whether if people saw the film, these people saw the film, they were more active now uh, than people who hadn't seen the film. And it turned out that they were. They were looking for more information. They were talking to friends and family about demanding better schools. They were donating books. 
and they were also volunteering or mentoring, which suggested that a documentary film was actually good at re-engaging the choir, because it's very easy for people to start focusing on other social issues if they have an activist sort of mindset. So a film could actually refocus people on a topic. Now, we were really excited to do an impact analysis of a narrative feature film by Steven Soderbergh. And of course, what we wanted to find out is whether a fictional film has the same sort of ability to shift knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. I'll play the trailer just to remind you uh, how scary this film was. It's a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. Did she mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? No, she said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Matt! Mom? No, no, uh, uh, go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. She had a history of seizures? No, no, no. Allergies? No. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. And he says, well, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? Okay. What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission, so we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will panic. Get away! It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm gonna get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. We're taking your time. We're not sick! It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutated. I love that she puts the oxygen mask over the camera. Ah, it's us. So, um, so we uh, created a matched control group again to compare apples to apples in terms of whether viewers had some outcomes that were somehow different from people who hadn't seen this film. And it turned out once again that they did. Uh, they did better on our quiz uh, about viruses. Uh, they were more likely to have prepared an emergency kit. They were washing their hands more frequently. I actually want to wash my hands right now after seeing that trailer. And they were talking to friends and family and neighbors about viruses. And one thing that we were trying to figure out with this survey in particular is, is how long these effects might last. You might think that we administered this survey right as people came out of the movie theater, but we did not. We waited three years before we surveyed people, and we still found statistically significant differences on these data points. That's how scary that film was. <laughs> So, as I said, we've also worked with news organizations, and we were thrilled to work with The Guardian. Um, they wanted to know whether their global development vertical was having some sort of impact on the people who were visiting it. And so what we did is, once again, we created a very uh, a control group that was perfectly matched against the people who were visiting the global development site. And because we had web analytics and we'd done this content analysis, we really had a huge amount of data about exactly what people had been exposed to. And what we discovered was that visitors to the global development site, compared to very similar people who were just wandering around on the World News site, was that they were both more aware and more knowledgeable about the Millennium Development Goals, which was the blueprint for global development. Now it's the Sustainable Development Goals. And they were more likely to have taken two actions, to sign a petition and to change their mind based on Guardian reporting. 
And we were really sort of struck by these two findings because it suggested that visitors to this section of the site were quite persuadable, that they really trusted the Guardian reporting, and that they were willing to translate that into actual social action. So I know I've just given you a little smattering of key highlights, but we have full reports available on the Media Impact site. I do encourage you to visit it. And you'll find on the Hollywood and Health Society site just uh, hundreds, literally, of papers and presentations about the effects of, of this program. I want to thank the researchers who have worked on this project. Many of them are here in the room. You guys rock. And thank you very much for your attention.